shame on me if OpenAI is not the first big company run by an AI CEO, right? But just parts like, of it. And I thought the whole thing, that's no, the very thing. ambitious. Like, just but that, the that finance is, department, whatever. Well, but eventually it should get to the whole thing, right? Yeah. So, so we can like use this and then try, try to like work backwards from that. And I find this a very interesting thought experiment of what would have to happen for an AI CEO to be able to do a much, much better job of running OpenAI than me, which clearly will happen someday. Okay, so OpenAI CEO Sam Altman just dropped a thought-provoking take on GPT-6 and where AI is headed. He even hinted that an AI CEO could soon run OpenAI. So first, let's hear what he unveiled about ChatGPT-6 before we dive deeper into his view on artificial superintelligence. Watch this. If GPT-3 was like the first moment where you saw like a glimmer of something that felt like the spiritual Turing test getting passed. GPT-5 is the first moment where you see a glimmer of AI doing new science. It's like very tiny things, but you know, here and there someone's posting like, oh, it figured this thing out or oh, it came up with this new idea or oh, it was like a useful collaborator on this paper. And there is a chance that GPT-6 will be a GPT-3 to 4 like leap that happened for kind of Turing test like stuff for science where Five has these tiny glimmers and six can really do it. So let's say I run a science lab and I know GPT-6 is coming. What should I be doing now to prepare for that? It's always a very hard question. Like e even if you know this thing is coming. Let's say I even to... had it now, right? What, what, what exactly would I do the next morning? Um, I mean, I guess the first thing you would do is just type in the current research questions you're struggling with, and maybe it'll say like, here's an idea or run this experiment or go do this other thing. And here's an interesting question from Tyler that led Sam to reveal a limitation of GPT-6. Now, OpenAI is in talks with Saudi Arabia, with UAE. Let's take the most optimistic scenario for how all that goes. What is it that top OpenAI management needs to know or understand about those countries and how is it you learn it? Um, well, it would depend on what we were doing with them. Putting data centers in a country or taking investment from a country or deploying commercial services would be very dip different than a set of other collaborations we could imagine. But generally speaking, to put data centers in a country, what we need to understand is who's going to run it. We don't operate our own data centers, but you know, Microsoft or Oracle or somebody else. What, are, what workload are we going to put there? So what model weights are we going to put there? And what are the security guarantees going to look like? We do want to build data centers around the world with lots of countries. Um, but for this question, which is kind of the main thing we deal with other countries for, um, those are the kinds of questions. If we were, which we don't have current plans, if we were like developing a custom model for some country, we'd have a whole bunch more questions. But they have different legal codes, different expectations from a deal. I'm not, I'm not saying it's in a bad way. It's just quite different, right? And do you do the Jared Kushner thing? Here's the 25 books I read. Or you sit down and you ask GPT-6 how to understand this culture, or you you bring in three experts. Like we, we bring in experts. You bring uh, in experts. We talk to the U.S. government a lot. We bring in experts. Again, if we're like if we're building a data center that a very trusted partner is going to operate, we know what the workload is, and it's being built like a kind of U.S. embassy or U.S. military base. We have a very different set of questions than if we were doing other things, which we have not yet decided to do, and we bring in more experts for. And those are quite intangible forms of knowledge, often. How good do you think GPT-6 is at teaching you those things? Or you still need the, the human experts to come in? Because you could just ask your own model, right? I don't think GPT-6 will have those intangibles. It might surprise us, but I, I wouldn't. I'd be very, I'd be, that'd be very unexpected if I was like, oh, don't need to talk to experts anymore. And here's another interesting answer from Sam. After he was asked, how good will GPT-6 be at poetry? I was going to say, I, I think like, I don't want to say GPT, whether it's six or seven, but I think we will get to something where you will say, this is like a, this is not long way to the very best, but like, this is like a real poet's okay poem. Do you think scientific labs might get GPT-6 this year? Not this year. Not this year. Here's a very difficult question. As you know, both you and I, we're fans of nuclear power, but we also know the insurance for nuclear power plants is provided by the government. The plants might be quite safe, but people worry. They're nervous Nellies. There's a lot of parties involved. So the federal government does the insurance. Do you worry that the future holds the same for AI companies, where the feds are your insurer? And how do you plan for that? 
again, even if AI is pretty safe, as with nuclear power, people are nervous Nellies. How will you ensure everything? In some level, like at some level, when something gets sufficiently huge, whether or not they are on paper, the federal government is kind of the insurer of last resort, as we've seen in various financial right. crises and insurance companies screwing things up. So I guess, given the magnitude of what I expect AI economic impact to look like, sort of, I do think the government ends up as like the insurer of last resort, but I don't, I think I mean that in a different way than you mean that. And I don't expect them to actually be like writing the policies in the way that maybe they do for nuclear. And there's a big difference between the government being the insurer of last resort and the insurer of first resort. Last resort's inevitable, but I'm worried they'll become the insurer of first resort. And that I don't want. I don't want that either. I, it's not, I don't, I don't think that's what will happen. I know, I know. We've seen so many debates about using nuclear power for AGI recently, but seems like it's not going to happen. So what resource will be used for the dream of superintelligence? You know, the stupidest question possible. Why don't we just make more GPUs? Because we need to make more electrons. But what's stopping that? What's the ultimate binding um, constraint? We're working on it really hard. I mean, this is, you know. But if you could have more of one thing to have oh. more compute, what would the one thing be? Electrons. Electrons. Yeah. Just energy. Yeah. And what's the most likely short-term solution for that? Short-term Easing, not full solution, but easing of the constraints. Short-term natural gas. Long-term. In will, the American South. Or wherever. Uh, Long-term, it will be dominated, I believe, by fusion and by solar. I don't know what ratio, but I would say those are the two winners. And you're still bullish on fusion. Very much. And solar. Do you worry that as long as it's called nuclear power... Even if it works. Did I say the word nuclear? No, you didn't, but other people will. <laughs> the people just won't want it. Getting back to the irrationality point in the insurance. You're the economist, not me, but I think there is some price point at a given level of safety where the demand for this will be overwhelming. If this is the same price as natural gas, maybe it's uh, unfortunately hard if it's one tenth the price i think we could agree it would happen very fast i don't know what the cut point is between do you ever worry there's some scenario where ultimately super intelligence doesn't need that much compute and in some funny way by investing in compute you're betting against progress over 30 year time horizon in the same way that like people always want more energy if it's cheaper i think people will always want more compute if it's cheaper so even if you can make incredibly smart models with much less compute, which I'm sure you can, the desire to consume in all sorts of new ways and do more stuff with more abundant intelligence, I'll take that bet every day. The, the, the related thing I worry about is that there is like a, a huge phase, phase shift on how we do compute. And we're all kind of like chasing a dead end paradigm. That would be bad. And what would that look like? I don't know, we like all switched to optical compute, like full on optical compute or something. And just have to spend a lot of money all over again. Yeah. Well, yeah. not on all of it. Like the energy is the energy, but yes, on everything else. Yeah. A dead end paradigm would be a huge waste of time, money, and natural resources. But obviously, he made his lifetime bet. Super intelligence, backed by tons of billions for AI infrastructure. And he does know what's coming. This tough interview with Sam and Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella will show you why. You know, obviously, OpenAI is one of the fastest growing companies in history. Satya, you said on the pod a year ago, this pod, that every new phase shift creates a new Google, and the Google of this phase shift is already known, and it's OpenAI. And none of this would have been possible had you guys not made the, these huge bets. With all that said, you know, OpenAI's revenues are still a reported $13 billion in 2025. And Sam, on your live stream this week, you talked about this massive commitment to compute, right? $1.4 trillion over the next four or five years with, you know, big commitments, $500 million to NVIDIA, $300 million to AMD and Oracle, $250 billion uh, to Azure. So I think the single biggest question I've heard all week and, and hanging over the market is how you know how can the company with 13 billion in revenues make 1.4 trillion of spend commitments you know and 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 you've heard the criticism First Sam of all, we're doing well more revenue than that second of yeah. all Brad if you want to sell your shares I'll find you a buyer if you <laughs> I, I just enough like you know people are 
I think there's a lot of people who would love to buy OpenAI shares. I don't. I don't think you, would including want to sell, myself, I, <laughs> including I think myself, people who talk with a lot of like breathless concern about our compute stuff or whatever that would be thrilled to buy shares. Uh, so I think we we could sell you know your shares or anybody else's to some of the people who are making the most noise on Twitter or whatever about this very quickly. We do plan for revenue to grow steeply. Revenue is growing steeply. We are taking a forward bet that it's going to continue to go, grow. And that not only will ChatGPT keep growing, but we will be able to become one of the important AI clouds that our consumer device business will be a significant and important thing that AI that can automate science will create huge value. So, you know, there are not many times that I want to be a public company, but one of the rare times it's appealing is when those people are writing these ridiculous open AI is about to go out of business and, you know, whatever. I would love to tell them they could just short the stock, and I would love to see them get burned on that. Um, but you know, I we carefully plan. We understand where the technology, where the capability is going to grow, go, and and how the products we can build around that and the revenue we can generate. We might screw it up. Like this is the bet that we're making, and we're taking a risk along with that. A certain risk is if we don't have the compute, we will not be able exactly. to generate the revenue or make the models at these at this kind of scale. Exactly. And Let so, me just say one thing, uh, uh, Brad, uh, as both a partner and um, an investor, there is not been a single business plan that I've seen from OpenAI that they're put in and not beaten it. So in some exactly. sense, this is the one place where, you know, in terms of their growth and just even the business, it's been an unbelievable execution, quite frankly. I mean, obviously, OpenAI, everyone talks about all the success in the usage and what have you. But even, um, I'd say, all up, uh, the business execution has been just pretty unbelievable. I heard Greg Brockman say on CNBC a couple of weeks ago, right, if we could 10x our compute, we might not have 10x more revenue, but we'd certainly have a lot more revenue. Simply because of lack of compute power. Things like... Yeah, it's just, it's really wild when I just look at how much we are held back. And in many ways, we have, you know, we've scaled our compute probably 10x over the past year. But if we had 10x more compute, I don't know if we'd have 10x more revenue, but I don't think it'd be that far. And we heard this from you as well last night, Satya, that you were compute constrained and growth would have been higher even if, if you had more compute. So help us contextualize, Sam, maybe like how compute constrained do you feel today? And do you, when you look at the build out over the course of the next two to three years, do you think you'll ever get to the point where you're not compute constrained? We talk about this question of, is there ever enough compute a lot? I think the answer is the only, the best way to think about this is like a energy or something. You can talk about demand for energy at a certain price point, but you can't talk about demand for energy without talking about at different you know, different demand at different price levels. If the price of compute per like unit of intelligence or whatever, however you want to think about it, fell by a factor of 100 tomorrow, you would see usage go up by much more than 100. And there'd be a lot of things that people would love to do with that compute that just make no economic sense at the current cost, but there would be new kind of demand. So I think the, the, now on the other hand, as the models get even smarter and you can use these models to cure cancer or discover novel physics or drive a bunch of humanoid robots to construct a space station or whatever crazy thing you want, then maybe there's huge willingness to pay a much higher rate cost per unit of intelligence for a much higher level of intelligence. That we don't know yet, but I would bet there will be. So I I think when you talk about capacity, it's it's like a you know cost per unit and you know capability per unit. And you have to kind of without those curves, it's sort of a made up number. It's it's not a super well-specified problem. Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing that, you know, Sam, you've talked about, which I think is the right way is to think about is that if intelligence is whatever log of compute, then you try and really make sure you keep getting efficient. And so that means the tokens per dollar per yeah. watt uh, and the economic value that the society gets out of it is what we should maximize and reduce the right. costs. And so that's where, if you sort of where, like the Jevons paradox point is that, right, which is, you keep reducing it, commoditizing in some sense intelligence, uh, so that it becomes the real driver of GDP growth all around. Unfortunately, it's something closer to uh, 
log of intelligence equals log of compute, but we may figure out better scaling laws and we may yeah. figure out how to beat this yet. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. Sam and OpenAI have a sophisticated plan for building super intelligence. That's why top investors trusted him with their money. But what exactly does super intelligence mean at its core from Sam's perspective? Watch this. The long-term future that you've described is super intelligence. What does that actually mean? And how will we know when we've hit it? If we had a system that could do better research, better AI research than, uh, say, the whole open AI research team, like if we were willing, if we said, okay, the best way we can use our GPUs is to let this AI decide what experiments we should run, smarter than like the whole brain trust of open AI. Yeah. And if that same, to make a personal example, if that same system could do a better job running open AI than I could, so you have something that's like, you know, better than the best researchers, better than me at this, better than other people at their jobs, that would feel like super intelligence to me. That is a sentence that would have sounded like science fiction just a couple of years ago. It still and now kind it kind of does, but it's you can like see it through the fog. Yes. And so one of the steps it sounds like you're saying on that path is this moment of scientific discovery of asking better questions, of grappling with things in a in a way that expert level humans do to yeah. come up with new discoveries. One of the things that keeps knocking around in my head is if we were in 1899, say, and we were able to give it all of physics up until that point and play it out a little bit, nothing further than that. Like, at what point would one of these systems come up with general relativity? Interesting question is, did you, like, if we think about that forward, like, like if we think of where we are now, should this, if, if we never got another piece of physics data, yeah. do we expect that a really good superintelligence could just think super hard about our existing data and maybe say, like, solve high energy physics with no new particle accelerator or does it need to build a new one and design new experiments obviously we don't know the answer to that different people have different speculation uh but i suspect we will find that for a lot of science it's not enough to just think harder about the data we have but we will need to build new instruments conduct new experiments and that will take some time like that that is the real world is slow and messy and you know whatever so I'm sure we could make some more progress just by thinking harder about the current scientific data we have in the world. But my guess is to make the big progress, we'll also need to build new machines and run new experiments, and there will be some slowdown built into that. Another way of, of thinking about this is AI systems now are just incredibly good at answering almost any question. But maybe one of the things we're saying is, it's another leap yet. And what Patrick's question is getting at is to ask the better questions. Or, or if we go back to this kind of timeline question, we could maybe say that AI systems are superhuman on one minute tasks, mm. but a long way to go to the thousand hour tasks. And there's a dimension of human intelligence that seems very different than AI systems when it comes to these long horizon tasks. Now, I think we will figure it out, but today it's a real weak point. We've heard the forecasts, the cautions, and the quiet confidence. And one truth keeps surfacing. The future won't arrive in a single breakthrough. It will advance in steps. More capable models, cheaper inference, denser compute, and a widening circle of real uses that move from novelty to necessity. We will argue about timelines. We will discover limits. We will cross some of them. Yet the center of this story is not a model card or a market cap. It is the human capacity to steer to set guardrails, to design incentives, to insist that power meets responsibility. So let's explore even more of that in our next episodes of the Path to Superintelligence podcast. Stay tuned, and thanks for watching.